It's Bob McCowan. It's John Sh- Shannon. See now they there there are just for the record, Bob. There are people on Twitter now that spell my name that way. I know. I see. That. <laughs> if my parents were alive, they wouldn't be very happy. But that's okay. Well, why not? You know. have a, you, I, I have managed to extend your name into yes. um, Could you more, please ex- than, more than two syllables. Would you please extend my career? I've been trying to do that, <laughs> which is why you're here right now. Oh, thank you. Oh, God bless you, Bob. As they say, John, I've done more for you than your mother. She, she only breastfed you for nine months. Now. Only nine? Whatever it was. Well, she <laughs> carried you for nine months. That's what it was. Um, that's very, you know, it's amazing. You bring that up today, Robert. Yeah. (laughs) And the reason is, no, it's okay. Um, we, uh, well, let's go right to our guest because, um, this is, he's a cool guy, right? Tell you what, I know you, you know, old players, you know, but this guy's, this guy's got something to talk about. He's a fun, fun guy. You know, know. I I love old players, but the incurious thing is, um, through, this uh, miserable little career that I've had, I, I've never had an opportunity to talk to this guy. Really? Never. No, never met him, never talked to him, never interviewed him, to the yeah. best of my recollection. I mean, I may be embarrassed here to find out somebody's going to dig something up and say, oh, you had him on uh, no, the show. You know. I, will, I will tell you right now, though, this guy was hard to interview when he was a player because he was so intense. Yeah. This guy wanted to win so badly, wanted to perform perfectly as a player every game, whether it be in St. Louis or Philadelphia or in Carolina. I, I And believe me, his reputation precedes him because I, I'd heard that. Yeah. Uh, in any event, we're going to get a chance today and we'll find out whether he's um, happy, miserable, uh, congenial, um, cooperative, um, or none of those things. Rod Brindamore, when we come back after these messages. It's McCallum, it's uh, Shannon on the program for this uh, day. And uh, with us, the uh, head coach of the Carolina Hurricanes, the Jack Adams Award winner, uh, former Stanley Cup champion, Rod Brindamore is uh, with us. Well, first of all, um, quite an an interesting last few days uh, for you, uh, renewing your contract. Uh, for the next three years with the Hurricanes and uh, the winner of the Jack Adams. Uh, congratulations. Quite quite an, an accomplishment. Well, it's like I said, uh, you know, when it happened, it, it's a it, it's an organizational award, right? I mean, <laughs> there's no coach that can d- take this award and go, oh, hey, look what I've done. I mean, if you don't have the horses, number one, you're not winning it. Let's just be fair. And then you got to have good people around you. And that's what I'm, I'm really lucky to have. So it's a good, a good to be recognized, but it's, uh, you know, I think even better for the organization. So, Rod, the uh, the contract uh, was announced on the 17th. By coincidence, you wore number 17 for so many years. But truthfully, when was the deal done? <laughs> you know what? No, it, that's a good question. The deal would have been done in about three minutes with Don and I. We, we had it figured out in January. You know, um, you know, I said, okay, here's, you know, here's the numbers. This is it. He was like, okay, yep, yeah, that's probably, that's pretty fair. And, you know, we'll move on. Uh, but I said, it, you know, there were some contingencies, you know, I said, we got to get all these other people around done. And unfortunately we had 10 people in the, in down there, downstairs where work with me that their contracts were up to. And that's what the holdup was. It just takes time to get all those people kind of figured out. And for the most part, we got everybody done. So that's what, that's what happened. No, no, I, no does that include Dean? Well, Dean's the one guy that's kind of hanging out there, um, you know, and he, he's he's welcome to come back. He's just trying to see if he can, you know, see what else he can get. And, and I'm okay with that. Uh, he's got to do what's right for his family, first and foremost. And um, But he knows that he's welcome back. So that's kind of a little trial period for him. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, Tom Dundon, the owner of the franchise, was on with us uh but John, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe? Maybe uh, six, maybe six weeks. Oh, was it that long? Yeah. And um, we talked to him extensively about, you know, your situation, your contract. And he was um, he was very clear. He didn't. He said he didn't want to own the franchise if uh, Rod Brindamore wasn't the, the head coach. So uh, you got, you got a, a friend and an ally there for sure. 
Tom's been great. Listen, he takes a lot of heat, which is, is, I think it's because he's new to it and, you know, he's not backing down from what he wants to do and how he wants to do things. And, and yet, you know, I don't know an owner that's can't be an owner that, that does more for his team than this guy. And far as he is involved in everything, you know, from you name it, from the smallest thing to the biggest thing from players. Um, and from day one, he said, Hey, look, I'm going to give you a fair fight. And that is we're going to spend the amount of same amount of money everybody else is spending on players, which is something you can't say was done here, you know, for, for many, many years. Trust me, I was a player here. I, I, you know, I lined up and looked across the way and be like, this is not a fair fight tonight, but we got to figure out how to win. And he's saying, we're going to take that element out of it. And now you just got to go coach him up. And, you know, I think uh, a lot, a lot can be said for that. Well, he's a fan of yours and he's a fan of the game, but he, is he a hands-on owner? You would know better than anybody. Oh, yeah, he's on everything. And that's, <laughs> and, and some people think that's like, oh, that's a bad thing. And I actually think it's the opposite because when we say, hey, you know, this player's got to go <laughs> and he's like, oh, and okay, you know, he'll, he, and, or we want to get these players. Like we're in the conversation at least with all this stuff. And, um, and he listens, right? Like he has his opinions and he'll throw them at me and Don, and he throws it all the time. Every day he's testing us on things that I don't know that he, believes it he's just throwing it to see if it sticks but you know what if we can tell him it doesn't or show him it does you know he's all about getting better and that's at the end of the day that's all you can ask how would you describe your coaching style uh i don't that's a better question for the guys i probably coached but i think i just try to be myself you know i just try to be honest as i can be i mean there are things you you can't be so honest i've learned <laughs> you know you got to sugarcoat it a little bit but really, at the end of the day, just be yourself. I mean, there's no way I, I could do this job if I was trying to be, you know, someone else or a different coaching style or whatever. You, you learn from everyone you're around. You guys know that. And then you just got to go out and trust your instincts. So, so I, ask, I ask coaches all this all the time. When you say something behind a bench, is there somebody you hear? Is there somebody in the back of the mind says, oh, my God, I, I sound like Bill Deneen or I sound like, I sound like somebody. Is there somebody that, that comes to mind for you? I don't think so. Um, I would hope not, you know, I mean, I hope it would be, that's me speaking, but I know there's everything that I probably do is come from somewhere, you know, someone, I mean, I got, uh, you know, even this Jack Adams award was great. Uh, Brian Sutter was the guy that right. presented it, you know, and I just think back to him when I was a kid, really he, he coached me as a kid and the stuff that I, I realized how much I've taken from even that couple of years with him, you know, transform me as a player, but am I still using that as a coach? I probably, you know, and there's, uh, and a lot that I wouldn't be doing, right? Like there's, you know, the times have changed. And so, um, again, you just, you, through all experience, you take the good and the bad. Well, Rod, I was going to ask you sort of the same question John asked, but let me rephrase it a little bit. Um, so you're, you're, you're not a duplication of anybody that um, coached you. You don't think about that. Um, but the best coach and your favorite coach can be two different people. In fact, quite often it is. Who is your favorite? Who is the, who was yeah. the guy you were closest to? Well, uh, that's a good question. When I, when I played, it wasn't all that long ago, but man, the years go by quick. Yeah, um, sure. You didn't have relationships with the coaches, you know, like I, I, the year we won the Stanley Cup in 2006, I went into the Peter Laviolette's office twice the whole year and had two conversations with him the whole year. Hmm. I, I actually, when I took the job as an assistant coach, I didn't even know what the, the coach's offices looked like in the back because I'd never been down there in 10 years that I'd been at that rate. Cause we just didn't, it's not how it worked. And now the, all the players know what everything like they're down there. They, they, they run the show. Right. So it's, it's a total transformation, but the guy I probably enjoyed the most was only for a year. And you mentioned him. I think uh, John was, was Bill Deneen. Mm. Um, just, I mean, you couldn't have it any better as a player. I'll just leave it at that. I mean, it was like your dad coaching you. And, you know, we had Kevin Deneen on the team. So his dad was the coach, but he treated <laughs> us all like his kids. And so when it was good, it was good. When it was bad, he get, you know, he was hard on his kids, but in a totally weird, loving way, if that makes any sense. Like it just never felt personal. It was always trying to help you. And that was pretty special. So I, I have been around the NHL longer than you have. I mean, which means now I'm really old. Um, but I used to hear about you, particularly in St. Louis as a player, that you were really hard on yourself. 
you beat yourself up if you didn't play well. Um, what changed? And do you beat yourself up as a coach? Uh, it's a great question because we got a kid in our lineup now. This is going to be a star, that's Shveshnikov. And he reminds me of myself in the way he handles things that don't go well. You know, he's hard on himself. And I, I see, I, I, so now I'm, I'm sitting in the coach's seat and I'm like, man, I'm, you know, building in now. Cause he would say, kid, you got to relax. And I'd be sitting there going, how do you say relax? But it's true. Now, you know, that I've gone through this. Now I'm trying to think, how do I get this coach talk through to this kid when him not to think it's, you know, what I did back when I was kid. Oh, come on. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. Like, because it, it, it's important. I mean, that's just from experience. Right. So it all, I guess you learn from all of it as you're going along. And I already forgot your question. Well, no, just how, how hard you I mean you were so hard on yourself yeah. as a player. Yeah. And my heart as a coach. Yes. And, and, and actually did an interview not too long ago with the great uh, coach from Duke coach K and on his show. And I asked him like, how do you do this? Like not just, you know, eat yourself up over and over. Like, cause when you win, you're supposed to win. So it's like, okay, how are you supposed to be that excited? You were supposed to win that game. And then when you lose, it's like twice as, you know, that was all your fault, right? Like, that's how you feel as a coach. Or, or, and I always say, when I played, you worried about your mistakes after the game. When you're a coach, you worry about the 20 guys' mistakes because they're all yours. So it's, it's not a very fun job when you do it that way. And he was all, he, his great comment was, you can't have a rear view mirror. Like you just, you always got to be looking ahead. And then I joked with him, well, he never loses. So it's, it's a little different, right? When you just can win every yeah. night. But uh, I think I'm hard on myself, which, you know, you know, I, I think you almost have to be, though, to keep pushing, moving forward. Well, yeah, you made, you made a valid statement. I mean, when you look at Krzyzewski and his record, um, and, okay, granted, it's college basketball. He's a Duke and, you know. Well, you only have I mean, the guys for two years. Rod, Rod could have a guy for 10. Well, I, I acknowledge it's different, John, but I mean, the truth of the matter is that, that if Coach K lost one game in a year, he probably was disappointed. You know, you can't say that in professional sports um, yeah. and certainly not in the National Hockey League with 82 game schedule. Um, Rod Brindamore is uh, with us. Um, how do you, do you, do you find over the years that you've now done this job, have the players changed dramatically? do you talk to them differently today than you did when you first started? Cause we hear all the time about the difference between, you know, when, when John and I were kids, you know, before you were born and, and how coaches ruled the roost and what the coach said goes, mm -hmm. well, you've gone through kind of an evolution of when you were a kid, the coach was what he said went. Um, but now it's more of a partnership, isn't it? Totally. Totally. If you don't think it's that way, you're not going to survive. I, I think, I don't know how you can coach the way it was coached back when we did. It won't work because these kids have never seen any of it. You know, they never, they won't even understand what's happening. And, and so you got to adapt with it. I think what's helped me is never stepping away from the game. So even when I stopped playing, I was right into the coaching on the assistant side. So I'm always involved. And then having kids of my own, to be honest with you at that age, going through it. I, I feel like yeah. I can relate to where they're coming from. Um, and so that's helped, but yeah, you, you, you've got to adapt with the times for sure. And uh, how has it changed? The athletes today are way better. Like they just keep getting better and better. They have, they take care of themselves way better. They've owned skills coaches and diet. Like they're, they have everything figured out, right? They got all these people helping them to be better. That's a, makes them better. It also makes them worse too. At sometimes they're so reliant on everybody yeah. else to tell them, get that feedback. And sometimes it's not good feedback. Sometimes just shut up and go do your job. You know, like it's all you got to do. Um, but they're always looking for that, the anchor, you know, if that makes any sense, instead of just, let's just focus on you being the best you can be. You don't need to have this validation all over the place. So there is a little bit of where as a coach, I'm trying to instill that. And I know in the background, they've got three guys telling them something else. You know, so there is all that that you have to kind of, I guess, deal with. But the athletes are so much better because they are 24-7 now. How, how, how do you actually, that's a really good point. Because I've heard other coaches say, uh, you know, players, have, he has his own shooting coach, his own stick handling coach. 
Well, and, and he's telling the, the guy different things than you're supposed to be telling him. How do you manage that? Exactly. Well, they all say that they're not. See, there's the, the key, John. They all go, well, no, 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 no. Their, their guy's not telling them to do it differently. They're just, I'm like, please, just let's cut that out. We know he's, you know, we had, we had a guy, and I won't mention his name. He's no longer with us, but he had his own guy that would break down shifts that he would send his shifts to. And then he would tell him, I say, that's what where our job is. I got three assistant coaches that are sitting here willing to work with you, go through your shifts. Oh yeah. But you know, and and, I, and then like, where are you going with this? Like, yeah. this is not going to be helpful. Right. But they all got, it. you have to figure it out. Now we got him out of there because we knew that wasn't going to work, you right. know? Um, but, but this is what is going on today. And I guess you take the good and the bad and the good ones get it. The good ones, I don't think have three people working for them, but they're, they're dialed in. Well, let me get a little more basic than that. Um, when you're a kid, coach says, this is how you do it, and you learn. Um, the older you get, the less instruction you get, I suppose. But not, when you get to the National Hockey League, how much teaching do you actually do? That is an unbelievable good question, simple. But if you really break it down, once you're at this level, how much coaching do you need is the one question. And I, as far as – to getting from point A to B. Am I going to make you a better skater at 19 years old than you no. are? Now? We can work on it till we're blue in the face. Uh, and there'll be skate coaches on here that'll tell you, oh, yeah, I can. Okay, maybe. Maybe a little better. You know, if we put in the time, I'll just tell you, I'll give you the ice time. We'll spend 20 more minutes after practice working on skating. I'll get you to be a better skater. But, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't know how much teaching you can do on your skills and what you already have. You are who you are. For the most part, you'll get stronger just naturally. If you're 19, by the time you're 22, you're in the gym and that'll help your skating, but to actually improve on it, you know, I don't know how much better you're going to get. Um, so how much teaching goes on? The teaching happens on how to play the game away from the puck. That mm. to me is where all the teaching comes in. We don't teach Andre Sveshkov what to do with the puck. And I'll tell you right now, very rarely. I mean, I'll tell him sometimes hang on to it more. You know, but I'm not telling him what to do with it. I'm not telling net cash what, how to, you know, shoot the puck. The guy knows how to shoot the puck. He's better than anyone I've seen. So we're not going to work on that, but I guess what? They need a ton of work on when they don't have the puck. And that's all the kids coming in. They need that more than ever, especially the younger kids that were really elite, elite players coming out of junior hockey. I find they don't, they play with the puck their whole life. Right. They never, yeah. they never had to play without it. And now they get the NHL and it's 90% of the time they don't have it that's a problem. So that's where the teaching comes in. I think at our level, is that the downside of all these great skill players? I don't think it's a downside because you can't teach the offense. Like you can't put it in them. Right. You know? So if you have that, if you can teach them how to play defense, it just takes a while, but you're not going to teach a kid how to rip a puck and go bar down and, you know, on the fly, take credit, pat on the back. That's not you, you know, you, you talked about um, uh, that you and Peter obviously had a good relationship when he was the coach in, in Carolina, but you weren't in the office very much. Uh, how, how do you use your senior players on your club to talk to teammates? I mean, you, you have J Jordan Stahl is one of the salt of the earth, great guys in the game. How so, do you use guys like Jordan? Yeah. So first of all, that's where I, you get lucky as a coach to walk into a locker room. I, I walked into it. I had Justin Williams sitting there on the sidelines. Right. Is a layup of layups that you could ever have where I need a leader. And oh, by the way, this guy hasn't been tagged yet as the leader. And he's sitting in your locker room. Oh, thank you. You know, boom. So he goes in and now everything starts to, you know, take shape. And then he leaves, but Jordan Stahl's sitting there ready to do it. And so that's, you have to have that. You have to have a guy that does it right. I mean, if you don't, you're, as a coach, you're going to be in big trouble. It's just hard. It makes it way harder. Now I got a guy that does it right. He takes control of the locker room. You know, I, I'll come in and you put your message and how it goes. And then he's got to put a stamp on it. And that's what happens on the good teams. They all have that. And, you know, we're fortunate to have that here. Rod Brindamore is with us, the head coach of the Carolina Hurricanes. we got more to come. Stick around. Back after these messages. It's Bob McCowan. It's John Shannon on the program today, as always. And Rod Brindamore, the head coach of the Carolina Hurricanes, is with us. Hold uh, on. Jack, Jack Adams, winner. We, we can't say that enough. Well, I was about to get to that. If you can be well, patient. Well, no, I'm I'm not patient. I'm like a hockey coach. I'm never patient. Right. <laughs> Got to get to it. Yeah. Your contract extension and the Jack Adams Award winner as a coach of the year in the National Hockey League. 
you were a captain of this team. Um, this is one of my favorite topics because everybody has a different perspective on it. Uh, in years of, of gone by, the, the captain in many cases was um, voted on by the team in the, in the locker room. And that captain's responsibility was definitive. He was theoretically the only guy who could talk to the referee on the ice or the assistants could. We understand how that has changed. But what do you see from a coach's perspective that the role of your captain is? Oh, well, we could talk all day on that. But to, to summarize it, it's it, you have to be the guy that does it. I said, do it right. He, he's got to be the guy that he's got to come to work every day, be competitive and do it consistently. That's the whole key, I think, is consistency. When you want a guy to be a leader, he's got to be every day doing it right. And then no excuses. So if the best player is your leader, that's number one. You can – that's really good. doesn't have to be your best player. But it's got to be a guy everyone looks up to, you know, and, and if, if, if you have that, the role of that guy is to set the standard, set the bar. He's the guy that everyone looks to and goes, okay, that's the way we have to do it. And then it's up to you as a coach to make sure you hold everybody accountable to that standard. And generally, though, if you've got a great team and a great leader, he holds everybody accountable. You don't really have to right. do it. So how often in a year do you think you would go to your captain uh, to – have him convey a message that you want to convey, but you don't really want it to come from you. Yeah. Uh, well, I've been doing this three years. So Justin Williams was my captain. Um, and in the first year, I don't think I went to him one time. I think he got it. So hmm. the good ones get it. They know when it's time to jump on the back of the coach's message, or sometimes even the best times is when you know, you'll be coming in ready to ream them out. Cause you know, it's time and the captain's already doing it. You know, you walk in the locker room and you're about to go and you hear captain going off, you turn around, go back to your coach's office. Okay. You know, he's got it. We're that that's the best way. You know, if I have to do it, you're, it's not right. It's, it, it'll, it has its moments, but it's much better coming from them. So in the three years now I go to Jordan's a little less vocal, but it's actually even more impactful when he does it. So now, you know, he's had his moments. So I jumped in probably a couple times this year and said, hey, Jordan, wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to, you know, and he's like, I got it. I'm already on it. You know, like, so I'm lucky that way. I don't have to micromanage that kind of flow of the, of the room. So you got knocked out in the second round by Tampa. How would you, uh, after a really, really impressive winning the division season, how would you define this season? So that's, it's, you have to almost break it down into two. I really do. I think the regular season is its own animal. I think you, you should get credit for having a good regular season because it's hard to have a good regular season. It's hard to go, you know, in our schedule, 82 games this year, 56, but crammed in with everything that went on and to do it right for that extended period of time, I think deserves some, but you have to start over. It's a new this playoffs go it's now it's like the second season mm -hmm. and you want to take everything you did coming in and move it forward, but it, it doesn't really work that way. So you, to answer your question, we had a good regular season, actually a great regular season. Yeah, you did. We, we lost 10 games. We lost 12, but the last two I, I count as throwaways because we didn't play our guys. We were trying to rest and, you know, so that's pretty impressive. The playoffs, I thought we had a good first round and then we were like here against Tampa and you can't give them that. Like you just, you're not going to beat them. You know, we took too many penalties. It really comes down to that. I watch them now. They're getting one power play a night. It's a different game than seven and six. It's a, it's a different animal. So we, we got to learn that lesson. Um, and, and that's where I think the Islanders have a little more experience on their side. They, they understand they can't take penalties. They're not quite as aggressive. They're kind of, Hey, we're okay playing this game. We don't have to take it to them. We can, we'll get our chances and you can see it's paying off for them. That's the patience of, uh, uh, of, I think, a veteran team, though, isn't it? Totally. And, and understanding. I mean, we talked about it, but our guys are hungry. And that's part of it that makes us good, too, is we are aggressive. So I, there's a fine line there that you have to kind of play. And I think the experience of it, though, to your point, for sure, is uh, an advantage. We, um, we sit um, here in a hockey market um, and look at a market that almost failed. 
uh, Raleigh almost didn't survive as a, as a hockey market for uh, economic reasons. And you, you know, it took a while to get the fan base motivated. Um, do you still, is Raleigh still a market that likes its hockey, but doesn't know as much as other markets do about it? No, I, here's what I think. I think number one, it had the, we had some success in years and then it would, would fall right off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This been able to just sustain a couple of years of good, solid play. It'd be a different story here. You know, uh, this place is crazy about hockey. It's just number one, it is a small market. So let's, let, let's. Yeah, we know that. Yeah. I don't even know if there's a million people that live in this area. Right. So like right away, I'm not, that's not a very big market that, especially when it's basketball country and college football, basketball. I mean, that's what they've, they've known. Yep. There's a huge following now though. Like we, we've really taken it to another level because we've had some success. So imagine that, you know, you have a little success, all of a sudden you're the hot thing in, in, in town. Um, and then COVID hit. Right. So that, that is interesting to see how this can all bounce back. But I think it is definitely a hockey market. Now, is it, is it, big revenue market, you know, that, that's a whole nother discussion. I mean, I know our, our ticket prices are lower than everywhere because that's just how it has to be. Um, I know there's way less opportunities for the sponsors and all the stuff that brings in the money that creates the revenues for owners. That's, that's where we don't match up. Um, but that I don't think changes. That's just the way it is. As far as fan base goes, I mean, I think it's great. I think it has to rank up there. If you just did per, capita or per person like the people that are involved in hockey here it's it's crazy and one of the advantages they have here is because it's a college market everybody here roots for nc state i, I had my hat because they're in the world college world series right now and i'm good friends with the coach and so but you know or you're a duke fan or a carolina fan they all hate each other it's the weirdest thing you can't be a state fan and a duke fan no uh, i get that uh, you just you can't do it. So, and I learned that right away, day one of coming here. So, but but the hurricanes are the one thing that they all can kind of hmm. people here can kind of come around. So, now that we're had success as a team and we're getting better, uh, I, I I think it'd be interesting to see this that, that question you gave me. Is that in three or four years from now are we even going to be talking about that? I, I, th- I don't think so. I was telling the boys before we started that uh, 2006. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard a louder building in my life right. than those four games of that Stanley Cup final against the Oilers. And then when you literally snatch the cup out of Gary's hands, I mean, that is one of the greatest yeah. t- trophy presentations of all time. Give me that cup. I mean, it, that was as loud as I've ever heard any building run. Yeah. And that's another point about what's great about down here is I don't, I, the people here come to a game, they, they enjoy it. They don't sit on their hands. You know, they come before you come to the playoff games here. I was driving up three, four hours before the game. There's people in the parking lot cooking out, yeah. you know, they're having a good time. They know how to have fun when they come and they, they don't sit on their hands, you know? And, and so it's, it's just a great atmosphere. And I think, there is something kind of special. Our, our players get it that we have to do a little more than maybe up in Toronto. You know what I mean? Like with the fans, we have to engage them. And so our guys do a little more They're They, you know, obviously we're more accessible, I think, than probably most teams are with their players, but that's part of it. And, and then there's, that's actually pretty special too. So that's all good. Going back to that time, that, that was, you know, that's the greatest memory of my life, really. I mean, you, you, you dream about that, right? Like yeah. that's what I dreamt of my whole life since I was a kid. Okay. I want to win a cup. I want to be, you know, have that opportunity. I get, it's funny. You said snatch the cup, right? From, I want to set the record straight. I, I didn't, I couldn't hear like anything. So I didn't know if you said, take it. And I wasn't waiting around, right? Like I didn't want to miss my chance. This was it. So it wasn't meant to be disrespectful or anything. It kind of came off that way, but uh, you know, you get, like I said, one time in the life, I'm not messing up on this. Like I'm taking it when I can get it. I'm not blaming you one bit. Cause you, you did what every one of us wanted to do when we were out either on the, on the pond exactly. or, or playing road hockey. We wanted to take that thing and put it over our head. So yeah. no, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm more interested in whether you, you ever said anything to Gary about it, uh, <laughs> an apology or whatever say hey i'm sorry i i probably should have because the way i got i got fined last year for you know my one time saying something and man 25 g's 
And it was like nothing threw that around. Like it was, you know, pocket change. And I'm like, Whoo, that's it. That's a year of college just went out the window. So <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, maybe he was, I should apologize. <laughs> hey, so speaking of coaching, you have more fun coaching your hurricanes or ho- coaching your kids team. Yeah. It's, uh, it's way more fun to coach the little guy. I, I just, that is the best age. You know, it puts me, it, it makes it fun again. And you know why you watch these kids just have a blast, right? Like having fun. That's what it's all about. And it, it's a great reality check for me. Cause I'll go from literally practicing on a Tuesday at our rink, same rink. Now we got this great practice rink. And then at five o'clock, I'm back out there with my guys and you know, it's just a gong show. Right. But it's just fun. And they're all having fun. And I'm like, man, this is, this is great. This is what it's all about. The, the, and you, and I literally saw you saw a video of you doing it between games of the playoff series. Yeah. No, I got home and we, they had, we had a day off and they had a tryout at seven in the morning. So, you know, I wanted to wow. go check it out and why not? Right. I'm there. I might as well help out. And that's kind of how we do it. And I'm kind of lucky. I, I think, you, you know, Justin Williams daughter's on the team. So he's like another excuse for us to kind of hang out and <laughs> get together. So it's uh, we have a blast with it for sure. So take us inside a little bit, compare kids hockey in, uh, in Raleigh to kids hockey when you were growing up. I mean, kids are kids, I guess, but okay, it is blow your mind. This will blow your mind. I, I, if I had grown up in Raleigh, North Carolina, yeah, playing hockey, I'd have been a better player than when I grew up in Camel River, British Columbia. Okay. So why, why do you think if I ask you, give me one, what do you think? Why because you- it's more, because you're having more fun. <laughs> Good point. Maybe. No, because the ice time, let me tell you something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The ice went out in whatever, April or March, as soon as the season ended, and didn't start up again until end of August in yeah. Camel River. And now maybe that's not how it is in other places, but here it's there's rinks. The ice is available anytime you want it. All year round, if you want to do that. I'm not saying yeah. that's the right idea, but just even to practice, to go pick up a stick and puck and pay your five bucks and go out. Now it's hard because literally it's a hundred kids out there. But back when I got here 20 years ago, like I, I saw, that's how I trained in the off season. I would work out at our place, pay five bucks, go on the ice and no one would be out there do stick and puck by myself. Like the ice is available. And now the coaching down here is actually great because all these ex NHL guys are coaching their kids and it's helped the program so much, but, it's interesting, but you're right. Hockey's hockey everywhere, I think. As long as you have good people kind of influencing the kids, it's all that matters. That's the other secret uh, thing. And one of the places you played uh, when you started in St. Louis, there's a ton of former NHLers that have really made an impact in minor hockey in St. Louis. I suppose you're going to see, we're going to start hearing and seeing kids a generation from now coming from the Carolinas. Well, for sure. There's been a couple sniffing around. And there, you know, a lot of college kids you know, my son included, like still playing college hockey. And I think there's another wave though, because they're, they're better now. Like I, I look back 10 years ago when my, my, my older son was on his team. And now I'm coaching that same level coming up and there's just way more kids, like just wow. the way it is. Are you competing with the attention of the kids from other sports? I mean, when you grew up in Canada, uh, Northern United States, generally speaking, if you played hockey, maybe you played baseball or softball in the, in the um, summertime, but you probably didn't play much football. You probably didn't play much basketball. Right. You, you know, you're, you're in a kind of a, a different area now. Yeah. You, you compete for the kids to get their attention to play hockey. The best athletes probably are playing other sports to start, yeah. to start down here. Like, but now with the popularity of it and, and, the, and by the way, down in Raleigh, there's nobody that's you find, from Raleigh, like everybody's from somewhere else, yeah. Or whatever. So, like, I, it's hard to find someone that's born and raised here now. Like, it's just so they're all coming from other places, and hockey's becoming a lot. Like I said, the youth movement is great down here; it's growing. But yeah, you're fighting that all the time, you know. Um, and then, it, still, at the end of the day, what is hockey? The biggest deterrent to playing hockey is the expense, right? Mm. It's it's a killer. And down here, if you're good, so you're a AAA level. Like, guess who you who is the nearest team that you can play is you got to go to Chicago, you got to go to Boston. You gotta, so you're so the year my I go back, my son now he's playing college hockey, but when he was 15, his last year here, we did we had 52 games, zero home games because you couldn't get a triple A team from wherever. Why they would come they down here? They don't need to. So you're going every other weekend, we were going somewhere. Wow, 
and that's a killer, right? That's that's tough. Wow. Oof. So I, I, I've got to, I've got to ask you the in the last sixteen months, the two best dressing room videos involve you. The first one was David Ayers when Ayers came off the ice with the and every every guy shook his beer and sprayed him and you made the speech. Uh, and then just a couple of weeks ago, uh, when you came in and put your dad on FaceTime and your team, I think, um, on its own saying your dad, happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. What did that mean to you? Uh, so I just, I just, you put me right back there. Uh, it's special because, you know, the older you get, you guys can relate. <laughs> like, <laughs> Thanks. Really, Thanks. You, no, but you only have your memories, right? Like, you go back and every day is the same. And then all of a sudden something special happens. And then 10 years later, if you have a picture or someone brings it up, you go, man, that was awesome. You know, that was special. And that's what your whole life. If you can get a bunch of those, then you got a pretty good life, you know? And so the David Ayers thing, that's just something that I'll, I will remember forever. And being a part of it was just special, unique as hell, you know, how it all transpired and great that we were, you were able to share in it and be a part of it. The whole thing with my dad, obviously family, super important and then just the way the guys just did, took it on their own I didn't expect that it just kind of happened and just it goes to show again the kind of people I get to work with you know special group and that was special and more so for him right like I know what it meant for to him to have as it said best birthday you know or, or ever and I and I got lucky because I forgot to give him anything so it was kind of <laughs> like I got a win-win you know so after a game I'm sure your dad has the NHL package after games you call after every game I call him on the way home. It's kind of, you know, it depends. If we win, I call him. If we lose, I usually just don't want to hear about it because he'll have some, you know, I should have done this or that. And well, he'll give you the advice. Oh yeah, he thinks he thinks he's he, he thinks he's I'm the reason that you know the success I've had is because of him. And there's some truth to it, but not on the coaching thing anymore. That's for sure. <laughs> the, the advice he gives me, I usually you know laugh about, but it's 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 been great for him to be able to watch the games you know i said he's had some health issues so he basically lives and breathes at the tv watching us and so it's it's been great uh before we let you go um so, uh, uh, coaches most of the coaches i think i've talked to over the years when the season ends they at least put hockey on pause for a while they don't continue to you know they don't go to the tv and start watching whatever's left Maybe it's part of getting that bitterness out of your system, that frustration. Um, do you have have you watched it all since your team has been out? Um, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll watch right to the end. You know, um, and this is actually the best time for like the, doing like even interviews and stuff because I I don't feel any pressure about tomorrow. You know, like I'm not antsy, and so it's actually I actually like doing them because I feel like you know just normal i don't know if that makes any sense but sure it does. when you're on it's like you're always worried about what you're saying how's that gonna affect somebody or you know and there's always something tomorrow that i gotta worry about so it's like yep. i want to get this interview out of the way you know like i got more important things to do um but our job never really ends because you know and it's good i'm involved in the draft you know involved in obviously free agency we got a bunch of guys we got to sign so we're in, involved in that and, and then you got this expansion draft and so there's a whole bunch of stuff that never ends, but until probably August, right? And then you get a couple of weeks where that's where, you know, you'll, you kind of take maybe some time to yourself, but that's how I like it. I just keep going. That's kind of how I think it, it should be. Okay. Now you've opened the door. You said you're involved in free agency. I got to ask you, you want Dougie back? Yeah. Oh yeah. I want all my guys back. And that's, you know, that's where coaches just, yeah, I know Donnie and Tom, they just kind of, okay, well, you can't have everyone back, but I'm like, well, let's figure out how we can do it. And, yeah. um, and you know, I, I just like being in the discussions yeah. and making sure they, they, and they, they listen and they're not just blowing me off. They know what we need to be successful. And if I say, I want a player back, we're going to try to do it. Now I'm all for it too. If, if the money's too high and it doesn't make sense, I'm like, no, we can't do that. We're not going to have money to sign the next guys that we need. So as long as we make fair offers to our guys, like I, I feel you know, that's, that's all you can do. And then, uh, you know, it's on to the next one. And the, the, the other one is, is that you're not the only trophy winner from your club. Uh, Jacob Slavin won the lady Bing. Uh, tell, uh, how special is he? Oh, man. If he played in up where you guys are, you, you would never stop talking about him. Man, well, he might be in the Norris discussion rather than the Bing. 
what exactly that's what i mean like it's mm-hmm. he's that good um great human being too which is, helps his likeness you know so sometimes you get guys that are that good and maybe they're not that good a person you don't really root for him that much it's the yeah. opposite of this guy um great player obviously so lucky to have him in our group um yeah i think i think and, and here's the thing if we use them a little differently like he would be up for the Norris probably, but we don't, you know, I, I don't need to put him out on the power. Play. Doesn't he play power play? Doesn't mm-hmm. get any of that time. Like, cause I, we don't need, necessarily need him to do that. So uh, he's a special player for sure. And you know, he'll be around a long time. Uh, it's been quite a year for, uh, for you um, and uh, for your team. Although I know you're disappointed that um, your team is on the sidelines. Now uh, I think you would agree. This is a, a franchise that has a future and it's not very far away. In fact, it might we might be right at the, um, the the tip of the next real significant step that your organization takes. We congratulate you on this year, and thanks very much for taking a few minutes uh, for us. It's uh, been a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, I, I I listen to you guys all the time. I feel like I know you. So, uh, <laughs> but but I appreciate you having me on, and you know, keep doing what you're doing. Talking hockey, it's great. Well, you do the same, and uh, you have a standing invitation to come back anytime you like, and uh, we'll, we may knock on your door before that happens, too. Anytime. Thanks, Rod. See you, boys. Rod Brindamore of the Carolina Hurricanes. We'll come back after these messages. It's McCowan in with uh, Shannon, and uh, again, our thanks to Rod Brindamore for uh, joining us. So at the beginning of the program, <laughs> um, I was wondering what kind of a guy Brindamore would be because he was prickly. For lack of oh, a he, he, he was he was he was so focused. He was intense. It, you know? He's so intense. But can you imagine playing for this guy? By the end of any speech, you'd go through the wall for him. Oh my God! Yeah, I mean, you were going to go through the wall just after talking to him for forty minutes. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I love the guy. Yeah. And I and I, I you know we, we we mentioned this before, but Tom Dundon, the owner of the franchise, was on with us several weeks ago, and. You know, you and you, I think you asked him a question about Brindamore and whether he was going to bring him back. Yeah. I really couldn't necessarily relate to, you know, what the relationship was like. And I know you're more familiar with it than I am. But now I get it. Now I get why Dundon wants, well, he didn't want him back. It was an absolute necessity. Yeah. Well, I I think you also got a a sense from Rod, uh, like Rod's Rod's a straight shooter. Like Rod, you know, there he he'll he'll go and communicate, you know, the the shortest distance between two points. I mean, and that's, I think that's what players would really appreciate. And, and I think he also has a great deal of respect for the players today, for what he shouldn't be coaching them and what he should be coaching them. Well, that's the sense I got. He's a yeah. modern he's a modern day coach who understands yeah. what the responsibilities and more importantly, perhaps the limitations yeah. of a coach are. Pretty candid in this. Era. I would, uh, that's he was much more candid than I remember him as a player for sure. Well, we, and we appreciate that. Um, and this is a really good, still young developing hockey team mm-hmm. that has, um, has progressed and has significant upside. And it would not be surprising in the next year or two to see them raise a Stanley cup. Would you be surprised? They st- they still have a few holes, um, but you know their core. They have such a good core. I mean, with Slavin, with Sveshnikov, they seem to have figured out what's going on and goal with Alex Nijelkovic. So they're 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 not a fly by night team. You know, Rod talked about how in in his time in Raleigh they would win a couple of years and then be down. Yeah. yeah. This 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 is a team I can see being consistent for the next six to seven years. Well, and I think this owner is committed to to doing what he needs to do. I mean, um, he has the money and he seems willing to spend it. So, And I think he likes winning. Oh, we know he likes winning. <laughs> yes. And I suspect he has no tolerance for losing. I think that's probably fair. So uh, in any event, again, our thanks to uh, Mr. Brindamore for uh, joining us on the program. Uh, that'll do it for us, Mr. Shannon, and we'll uh, speak with you again tomorrow. For John, Bob, have yourselves a swell day, evening, or overnight. And we'll uh, see you next time. Bye, everybody.